Good morning, Harefield. Fancy seeing you here. <clears throat> well, we're going to start a new series today, but this series is going to be a bit different in the fact that we're actually going to be covering it over the whole year, so you won't get it all in one go. And the series is called How Long? Well, I really enjoyed Gary's thought for the week this week. Um, I thought he really brought us into the valleys so very well. And uh, it was so lovely to uh, have a little guided tour of his, his stomping ground when he was a young lad. Grew up in the Principality of Wales. As for me, I actually grew up in the province, the province of Northern Ireland. Now, when you speak with a Northern Ireland accent, it's very difficult not to sound very aggressive and belligerent. But uh, I'm not belligerent or aggressive. Um, Belfast, my home city, and famous for building Titanic and other wonderful liners. Titanic was in good condition when it was handed over to the White Star Line and uh, whatever they did to it after that can't blame Belfast. Famous for the Giant's Causeway, Bush Mills Whiskey, The Troubles. The place I lived for the first eight years of my life is just down the road from Stormont. Stormont being the Parliament building of Northern Ireland and it's set in a beautiful park with a very steep hill about a mile long from the main gates. Uh, I used to pass this every day on my way to school. So I was actually uh, living for the first eight years of my life in this road towards the end of East Belfast, not very, very far into the city as it were, quite near to open countryside, not far from the coast. Barnet's Road was our road as, a, as you can see and if you look up Barnet's Road from the bottom there's a slight hill up there and uh, you'll see the first the first red brick house on the left going on from there you'll see their pebble dash but this first one um, is a semi-detached house and we lived in the what the far end not the one near the end nearest to the bottom of the road here but the next one along. This is it. That's taken in a later photograph. It's a little bit neater than, than when we lived in it, but um, the strange thing is that yeah, the windows have all been changed, but the gates and the railings at the front are exactly the same ones as when I lived there. And I used to really enjoy going out from 169, that's the number there, um, and with a little jam jar of water with a paintbrush because our gates and our railings were green and the green had kind of like faded and when I painted them with water they came up beautifully shiny again which of course it dried out after a while but I used to like that so that was what I used to do um, not all the time I did have um, friends and uh, one of my friends Paul, Paul Kirk lived directly opposite our house. And Paul was the same age as me, and we used to go to school together. Um, now, you might think that up to the age of eight, people, kids weren't going to school. Well, I had to travel a couple of miles to school. And uh, my infant school, two miles up quite a busy road. Um, could you imagine allowing a five-year-old or a six-year-old to travel on a bus to school. Well, that's exactly what my mother did, my parents did. After a number of times she took me there, after that, just like everybody else, we all made our own way there. So in the morning, I'd pick up my bus money and I would go across the road and knock for Paul, or he would knock for me, depending on who got up first. And we would walk round the corner, past this little parade of shops, which looks a bit different from when I um, 
when I lived there, um, of course it's different, uh, just like Gary said, it's all changed, but um, Jesus is the same. And that grey sort of building on the end there used to be Violet's Cake and Bakery. And we used to go there for our, for our cakes and potato bread and soda farls and, you know, wheat and things like that. Lovely little non-Irish specialities. Very important for an Ulster fry. Anyway, um, it's changed. It looks like a green. But if you look further along, right up to the other end, you'll see um, like a supermarket there, a couple of shops. Well, the end one um, was Mr. McMinn's paper shop, sweet shop, tobacconists. And that's where I used to go and, and uh, buy my sweets. Not only that, it's where I used to go to buy my fireworks. Yes, uh, yes, I was allowed to buy fireworks. If you had the money for them, Mr. McMinn would sell them to you. I know, I was only six, seven, eight years old. But I used, for, used to go and buy fireworks with my pocket money. I know, it's, it sounds absolutely ridiculous, but that's exactly what happened. So we walked past those shops and along the to the end of the road and there we waited at this bus stop and um, you can see the road is empty that's uh, early on a Sunday morning a few years ago uh, but that is a busy road that's called the Upper Newtonards Road that road leads uh, if you look in, looking along the road there that goes towards Stormont and the city of Belfast if you go the other way you're out to uh, a town called Newtonards which is just on the banks of Strangford Loch Anyway, we would wait at that bus stop for the trolley bus to arrive. Yes, we had trolley buses. We were very eco-friendly in those days. These trolley buses were electric. They had overhead cables. They weighed about 10 tonnes. You couldn't hear them coming. And um, we had our pennies ready to pay the fare. And when the trolley bus, we could take any bus at all because they all headed into Belfast. It didn't make any difference. They didn't branch off before our school. So we got on the trolley bus and we sat down and we waited for the um, conductor to come and collect our fare. And if he didn't collect our fare, if he overlooked us, we had a little bit of spending money. Anyway, day at school, went through that. And then, oh, by the way, yes, there are the gates of Stormont. We passed those every day. So that's right on the road and uh, we'd pass that going to and from school. A couple of miles up the road was our school and we would do our day at school. I used to have school dinners, they were disgusting. So sometimes if I felt particularly peckish and the school, the, the school dinner was so awful, they didn't care if you ate it or not basically because they knew it was rubbish, but uh, it was just like pig swill. But I think even the pigs rejected it, to be honest. But anyway, um, they would um, let you eat it or not eat it. It's up to you. You paid for it. You, you know, that was the end of it. Um, so if I was peckish, and, because the lunch had been particularly bad that day, I might just decide to um, walk home a couple of miles from the age of five or six. My mother didn't mind. And you see, the beauty of walking home was that I could actually um, spend my money at the sweet shop, which is just opposite those gates there. And I could have some crisps or some sweets or something on the way home. Uh, there was a crossing lollipop man at school, so he could see us across the road. But when we came home again on the bus, there was no crossing person. So we got off the bus and we were very careful to do our curb drill and cross a four lane road to get back home again. Now, you could, my, my parents were completely negligent, but I wouldn't have had it any other way, to be honest. I just enjoyed the freedom that we used to have in those days. Anyway, um, What on earth is he talking about? Why are we going d down his memory lane today? Well, I'll tell you. Just opposite those gates, I'll go back to those again. Just opposite those gates, the road 
the corner of which was the sweet shop, I could walk over, walk down there and join Barnet's Road because it was quite a long road. It ran sort of almost parallel with the upper Newtonards Road, um, but less busy, less traffic. So I could walk down the, there and turn left, go back to house, to, my, to our house. Just along that road there lived our family GP, Mr. Goldring, Dr. Goldring. And he lived in the house and it was his surgery as well, as used to be the, quite often the case in those days. And I used to go there if I was ill, um, you know, remember a few things. One time I went there with a, this fingernail here, I, I bashed it with a brick. Now you might, I know why, why? Well, I'll tell you, I had a cap gun and it used to fire those rolls of caps, make a banging noise. Well, the gun broke, but I still had some spare caps. So I, in the front of our house, I would just put it on the wall and there was a brick there. So I used to bang it you know, bang the caps to let them off. Well, one time I misjudged it, I bashed my finger and I think I made a lot more noise than the caps did. Uh, lost my fingernail, had to go to Dr. Goldring. But also I used to go there for my vaccinations. Now we're all into vaccinations at the moment, but um, in those days, obviously vaccines weren't so good as they are nowadays. Um, anyway, I went along there and my mother took me to have my whooping cough vaccination and Dr. Goldring said, I am not going to vaccinate him. I'm not going to vaccinate. He, he refused to vaccinate my sister as well. And the reason for this was that his own son had suffered brain damage through those early vaccines. Um, and after that, he would not take the risk of vaccinating anybody because he would not want it on his conscience. He'd had, he knew what it was like because his own son had suffered. So I didn't get those vaccinations. So I can remember going back, well, I suppose I was five or six years old, I um, caught a whole series of horrible diseases straight one after the other. I had mumps, I had measles, I also had whooping cough, which of course is a killer. It didn't kill me, but um, there you go. Um, so I had those diseases. It's seemingly one after the other. And I had to spend a lot of time off school, off school. I had to spend a lot of time in bed. And I can remember lying in bed. It just seemed to go on and on and on. I can remember even one time, you know those blankets where there's kind of like the, the whipping on the end of it? It was all tangled around my legs and I was in a terrible state. And I just, how long is this going to go on for? That was the cry I'm, I gave. How long? How long? And that's a kind of question that we're often asking. And I bet we're asking it now. How long is this lockdown going to go on? How long is this pandemic going to last? How long will we have to wait? We want everything instantaneously these days, don't we? I mean, I'm, you, you know, a whole year of being locked down is terrible, almost almost a whole year. But we get frustrated if the internet doesn't work immediately. We get frustrated if our Amazon Prime delivery doesn't arrive within one day as they promise it would. We keep asking how long is it going to be before you know the bank processes our payment. Faster payments is within two hours these days. It used to be weeks in the old days. Whenever you're on a car journey, what do the kids ask? Oh, is it much longer? How much longer is it going to be? We're nearly there yet. They want to get there immediately. I mean, we, you know, we don't like delays anyway. I can remember we took our girls when they were much younger. We took them on a little touring holiday of, uh, of uh, Europe. We went into camps. We, it was a Euro camp holiday, so we um, had ready-pitched tents and mobile homes and that sort of thing. And we travelled around, you know, we did... France and Belgium and Luxembourg and Switzerland and Austria and Italy and we had a great time. It was wonderful. Four weeks we took. And one day I can remember particularly we were in Switzerland and we thought that's a very short journey we've got to do today. You know we didn't travel the whole time but this particular day we had to get from one place to another one. I can't remember exactly where it was and it looked no problem. It won't take long. We'll be there by you know long before lunchtime just maybe sometime after 11th's after we, uh, you know, set off, well, took the whole day. 
It's only a short distance on the map, but because you're going over a mountain and there's all sorts of hairpin bends to get there, you, can go, you only go slowly, you get held up by those cyclists. Why would you want to cycle up and out? It's crazy. It's mad. I admire them in a way, but I don't admire them when they're holding me up. And the kids, oh, how much further? It's not, far, it's not far now. And of course, it took the whole day to get there because it, did, it was a lot further than it looked. But we get fed up as well, don't we? How long? That's the question. How long? And you can see the date there behind me. 15th of February. It's only just passed the anniversary of this date. It's only just passed like a, a few days ago, hasn't it? <coughs> Pardon me. But, um, you know, 15th of February, 519 BC, a night that Zechariah the prophet would remember forever because he had so many visions that night. And we're just going to look. Now, we did have a little look at this earlier in the year, but you, you won't remember it. Anyway, here we go. Here's the, um, here's the, the text. During the night, I had a vision. This is Zechariah 1. During the night, I had a vision. And there before me was a man mounted on a red horse. He was standing among the myrtle trees in a ravine. Behind him were red, brown and white horses. I asked, what are these, my Lord? The angel who was talking to me, talk, sorry, he was talking with me, answered, I'll show you what they are. Then the man standing among the myrtle trees explained, they are the ones the Lord has sent to go throughout the earth. And they reported to the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtle trees, we've gone throughout the earth and found the whole world at rest and in peace. World peace is something that, you know, we, want to, we aim for. We, we'd love to have peace on earth, wouldn't we? You know, we... we, we you, anybody who's asked, what, you know, what would your ambition be? What would you really like to achieve? Peace on earth, they say. Peace on earth. You know, have world peace, no more war. And this is what this angel seemed to be reporting. Now see, Zechariah's here, and he's got an angel with him. And the angel seems to be kind of like helping him along to try and, uh, in this vision, he's trying to get him to sort of get to the bottom of it. Anyway, he sees this man in the ravine next to the myrtle trees. Myrtle trees speaks to us of Israel. And remember, the Israelis, the Jews, have been God's people have been exiled for 70 years. You know, we say, how long? And we've been waiting for sort of almost a year to get sort of a little bit more freedom. And they've been waiting 70 years. It's incredible. So there's this angel with Zechariah, and he wants to know, you know, wants to know what these, what are these horses and, and this person in the, in the myrtle trees? And, you know, the myrtle trees speak of Israel, as we said, but then it seems like the angel asks on Zechariah's behalf this man in the, in the myrtle trees, and who is another angel, or but so often as we find in Scripture, um, he's actually a pre-incarnate Jesus. He's God himself. Now, you know in the Bible, the Bible says that um, no one can look at God and live. So it isn't uh, such God, it's God in sort of a human form. And there's this guy in the myrtle tree. He said, well, these are the messengers. We, we send them throughout the earth to sort of report back and see how things are going. Well, <clears throat> And it's all, it's all good, it's nice and peaceful, it's restful. But of course we know it isn't. How can, it be, how can everything be good when God's people have been sent out of their homeland and the temple's destroyed and Jerusalem's not even been built back up again? How can that be good? Everything's at rest and at peace. Well, it may be man's idea of peace, peace but it's not God's. So God doesn't want any old kind of peace on earth. God wants his peace. He wants peace in the terms of the Prince of Peace. He does not want any old peace, the devices of man. 
who say, you know, we'll come up with this scheme, we'll have United Nations, we'll put this, these countries together. Thrown down through the ages, people, men and mostly men, but men and women have, have tried to manipulate to get peace. Maybe they do it for their own ends, I don't know. So God doesn't want world peace on man's terms. You know, you might say, oh, well, any, any old peace is better than no peace. Well, possibly, but God's peace is far better than man's peace. The peace that passes all understanding. So then comes the, the question. The man in the myrtle trees is Jesus. And the angel of the Lord said, this is the one who's with, who's with Zechariah, helping him along. The angel of the Lord said, Lord Almighty. That's Jesus, isn't it? Lord Almighty, how long will you withhold mercy from Jerusalem and from the towns of Judah, which you have been angry with these 70 years? How long? He asked that question. How long is it going to take? How long have we got to suffer? How long will we be exiled and out of our country? So the Lord spoke kind and comforting words to the angel who talked with me. The Lord spoke kind and comforting words to the angel who talked with me. Everybody, God has got kind and comforting words for you and for us. We'll find out a little bit more the kind of comforting words that he'll be saying to us now. Then the angel who was speaking to me said, proclaim this word. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I'm very jealous <coughs> for Jerusalem and Zion. And I'm very angry with the nations that feel secure. I was only a little angry, but they went too far with the punishment. Now when you look at the, t the word jealous it's not like a sort of teenage romance you know he's going out with her but this other one number three comes along and he fancies her and she sort of flirts with him and so number one gets jealous it's not that kind of stuff jealous you could put in its place the word zealous full of zeal full of enthusiasm full of passion so, the Lord Almighty said, I am very zealous for Jerusalem and Zion. My people, I love them. I don't want them to be exiled forever. I'm not going to hold their sin against them forever. God's saying to you this morning, I'm not going to hold your sin against you. Jesus died so that you could be forgiven for your sins. And he's saying, I haven't forgotten my people. I know it seems like a long time. It seems like I haven't moved for ages but I've been there all along and I am very very passionate I'm very zealous for my people and then he goes on to say I'm angry with the nations that feel secure oh yeah they think they've got peace they think they've brokered peace they think they're intelligent they think they've got it all licked but no they haven't because they're oppressing my people and when they're oppressing my people I was a bit angry with them to start with but of course that was part of the discipline of my people. But now, they've gone too far. I'm not going to put a stop to it. I'm cross with them. I'm angry with them. How long will you withhold mercy, says the angel to, to Jesus. And Jesus says, I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm speaking comforting words. And you know what? He wants to speak kind and comforting words to us. You know, I'm zealous for Jerusalem. I'm angry with these self-satisfied smug nations and these leaders who are in it for their own ends and their own fame. But they've gone too far. This is going to end. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. I will return to Jerusalem with mercy and there my house will be rebuilt and the measuring line will be stretched out over Jerusalem, declares the Lord Almighty. Proclaim further. This is what the Lord Almighty says. My towns will again overflow with prosperity and the Lord will again comfort Zion and choose Jerusalem. I 
I am jealous, zealous for my people at Harefield. I want to rebuild them. I want to give them a new start, a small beginning. Do not despise the days of small beginnings. My house will be rebuilt. My people will be built up. I will comfort my people. I have not forgotten you. I am there for you. I was there all along. I've been watching over you. I'm going to survey the whole scene and things are going to start moving again. That's what God said to Zechariah with regard to the people then. I believe God is saying the same thing to us. We've just had a, a series, you know, return to me. Come back to me, and then I can come back to you. And now I think he's giving us words of kindness, words of hope, words of love. How long is it going to take? I don't know, but it's going to happen. I don't know how long it will take. But what I just want to say, leave you with one more little scripture. <clears throat> a short psalm. Psalm 40. Let's have a, just have a look at that. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and he heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Men, many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. And I would just love it, and I'm sure the Lord would love it, if you had a new song in your mouth. His praise is on your lips, because he sent Jesus to be our saviour. Hallelujah. He sent his Holy Spirit to give us boldness, gifts and power. And I just pray that in these days where we're probably calling out how long, in these days of suffering, and I know that some of you have suffered badly, some of you have been ill, some of you have relatives who have been ill and some relatives who have passed away. But how long? I don't know. But God is going to rebuild his people. He's going to, from a small beginning, he's going to rebuild us. Well, that's all I've got to say. So I'm just going to pray now. I want to pray that God blesses you and us and that things start to happen. We eagerly await Boris's pronouncement tomorrow afternoon. So let's just pray now. Heavenly Father, I do pray for our government, our queen, <clears throat> our royal family, and those who are in authority over us. I pray for them. I pray that your guidance will come their way, that they will reach out to you and not just to the designs of man. I pray, Lord, that you would bless each one of us. And Lord, that we may have been asking how long. Lord, you're going to do things. You're going to rebuild us. You're going to set us in motion from a small beginning to a big end. Lord, I just pray that you'll be with every one of us. You'll bless us and our families because we're asking it in the wonderful name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. Amen, everybody. Have a wonderful morning. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.